doing the school together since the very beginning. And so in a certain sense, um, we should, she should introduce me, I should, we should introduce each other, something. Um, but in any event, because there's some of you who are new to us and may not know Anna, she, um, she's uh, at the University of Rochester where she's professor of Russian, uh, I think the technical title is Russian professor, teaching professor, is that correct? Something yeah. like that. Something like that, yeah. Um, and that's her <clears throat> sort of, her night job, her day job was at, uh, for career was at St. Petersburg State University. Um, and I'm here in St. Petersburg now and she's in Rochester. So there's a bit of a switch, um, but um, where she was a uh, professor of um, English and American literature and, and um, studies and also founded the center for I always get the name of the center wrong, but the Center for American Studies, I believe it was I called. Think so yeah, John, you got it right. Or English? No, I think it's. But wasn't there a British oh, well, and Amer American oh, studies? British and American studies. Right, 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 right. Yeah, At St. Petersburg State University. Than you do. <laughs> right, and that's where we actually first met about twenty years ago, and this whole project got started because we met and started to talk about the possibility of a of a of a school like this. Um, and here we are. Um, and um, in the meantime, while the rest of us are, um, you know, doing various things of less interest, Anna has been working on uh, Nabokov and she gave a class in our previous virtual school, a, a full class on it. Um, but today we're just gonna have um, a lecture on her, her re recent work on Bergsonian time in Nabokov's early prose. And so um, other than thanking her for being my sister in life over all these years. Um, I'm delighted to let Anna tell us about what she's been doing. So please welcome Anna Masmi. Hello everyone. And with a bit of trepidation, I'm going to introduce to you the work I'm doing now. Uh, it is not exactly my field and I sort of trespassed on foreign uh, territory. Uh, but as I was teaching uh, early Nabokov prose, uh, I got interested in Andre Bergson. And this interest led me to even struggle uh, through a couple of his books and use them in my teaching. Uh, what I found out was that uh, most researchers who speak about uh, Nabokov and who write about Nabokov mostly concentrate on Nabokov's later work. And the token uh, book, the token novel for analysis of Nabokov's influence, uh, of uh, Bergson's influence on Nabokov uh, is certainly Speak Memory, which has been analyzed, analyzed in great detail, but I will give only one reference to this book. Uh, as I read his early novels, and especially his three earliest ones, uh, namely Mary, King, Queen, Knave, uh, and the Eye, I found out that there are almost direct references to uh, Bertsol. Uh, what I wouldn't do is I would try to avoid as much as I can using the word symbol, which uh, Nabokov absolutely hated. And even the word metaphor, because Nabokov uh, stood for clear and uh, uh, translucent uh, style. Uh, but I will start with speaking uh, about Andre Bergson. And probably you will not fall asleep in the first five minutes because I will be speaking about scandal. And scandal is something that gives food to, to the newspapers around the world. Uh, so in 1922, Henri Bergson, who was one of the most outstanding, most renowned philosophers in both Europe and uh, in both France and Europe, uh, got the post of the president of International Commission 
for intellectual cooperation. This commission was something akin to uh, UNESCO these days. And Henri Bergson was uh, <clears throat> the best candidate for it because presidents and prime ministers uh, would come and seek his advice uh, in <clears throat> making decisions. And he was known for his uh, diplomatic qualities and for his uh, incredible, that's the only word I can use, his incredible erudition. Uh, he was so popular that when he agreed to give public lect uh, lectures in, Fran in Paris, uh, the Parisian elite would send their servants to get hold of the seats two hours before. So that by the time Bergson showed up to give his lectures, uh, <clears throat> they could replace their servants. That was the level of his popularity. Uh, at that time, uh, Bergson was working on the uh, problems of, uh, on the issues of inner time uh, and uh, his famous <clears throat> concept of durée. Uh, these were the <clears throat> uh, these were the uh, theories and uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and these were the theories that he worked out uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And it happened that they were at odds uh, with the most popular, with the loudest scientific theory of the time, nothing less than the theory of uh, relativity. Uh, the author of the relativity theory uh, Einstein lived in Germany. And uh, if you look at the date, 1922, you will very easily understand that that was the time when the relations between France and England on the one hand and Germany on the other hand were very far from easy. And one of the ideas that Henri Bergson had was to have an open discussion and to have uh, Einstein uh, speak, uh, speak to the victors, which was a bit of a problem for Einstein because Einstein at that time represented Germany. Uh, both made steps towards each other. And uh, uh, the meeting took place. Einstein spoke about the uh, theory of relativity and uh, came into a serious debate with uh, Bergson. Uh, by the end of the debate, Bergson asked what he thought to be a killer question. He asked Einstein, and what do we do with the time of the philosophers? To which a younger scientist with a big name answered without any thinking, there is no such thing as time of the philosophers. The reputation of the big matter of uh, French philosophy was at stake. Criticism came right and left. And uh, uh, I will give you only uh, one example. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when Bertrand Russell uh, said that, yes, intellect is the misery of the world. But, uh, but intuition is something that is known to bugs, bees, and Bergson. So <clears throat> that was the beginning of uh, the debate. And this debate, uh, this debate actually uh, cost Einstein uh, partially cost Einstein his Nobel Prize because 
he got his Nobel Prize, not for relativity theory, but he got it for some further elements uh, in his theory. So the, the value of the uh, Nobel Prize was uh, put at a lower grade. Uh, what was the cause of uh, Bergson's uh, criticism of uh, Einstein on the one hand and Einstein's uh, rebuffing on the other hand? Uh, the relativity theory uh, was uh, known in two uh, variations. There was the specialty theory and there was the theory itself. Uh, the specialty theory led to paradoxes from uh, the common sense point of view. And uh, uh, Bergson, who believed in the relativity theory, uh, still considered them detrimental for his theory. The one most known, and I'm sure most of you know it, is the famous twin paradox. According to Einstein, if we took two twins, one stayed on the earth and the other was taken into the open space in a rocket. Due to the differences in speed, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, when the rocket returned uh, to the earth, uh, the twin in the rocket would be younger than the twin who stayed on the earth. And that made, uh, that made uh, Einstein furious because Einstein considered uh, that uh, there were no possible, uh, possible reprimands, there were no possible, there was no possible criticism uh, for his theory. And uh, uh, he actually believed that past, present and future were determined. So if we can speak about the finality and determination of the past, that is more or less clear. But what about future? And I will quote Einstein now. Einstein said that the future was as predictable as the past. And we could say in 1922, who will give the inauguration speech on, in January of 2017? And we could also say that in about two weeks or in two weeks exactly, I will be sitting in a cafe drinking coffee and I will spill this coffee on my new pants. And this was the beginning. And if uh, Bergson's remarks cost uh, Einstein a part of his Nobel Prize, uh, Bergson's remarks cost him his name and his legacy. Because for many years, Bergson was almost forgotten. And he came back as somebody who is worth reading and somebody who is uh, uh, worth uh, studying only in the 60s, late 50s and 60s, and he actually influenced, to a large extent, the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. So with this uh, introduction, I can uh, proceed now to what are the uh, principles, what are the, uh, what are the uh, items of uh, uh, Bergson's philosophy uh, that influenced the world and that influenced, uh, to a large extent, uh, Nabokov. Uh, yeah, and a little afterward to this whole Bergson versus Einstein uh, scandal. By the end of the 20s, in 1927, uh, Werner Heisenberg uh, and Niels Bohr came up uh, with the principles of uh, thermodynamics. And in the principles of thermodynamics, uh, 
Bergson's, uh, Bergson's concepts of duration, Bergson's understanding of inner time were very well, uh, they very well fit into their theory. So to some extent, uh, the good name of Bergson was uh, brought back, but generally he came into, into almost absolute oblivion. Uh, he was taught in philosophy courses, uh, especially after the Second World War, and his name was known only to the select few. Uh, I will uh, concentrate today mostly on his 1896 uh, work, which is called Matter and Memory. Uh, in Matter and Memory, uh, Bergson continues Heraclitus' idea of universal flux. So what he says, everything is in flux. Uh, it is people, it is matter, uh, it is our consciousness. And we cannot speak about time. He said that time was sort of stolen by scientists. And here we have a division line between scientists and uh, philosophers. Time was stolen by uh, scientists and used as a uh, space category. And indeed, we speak about the length of time, the section of time, etc., and so on. And what about the human time? I return to uh, Bergson's question to uh, <clears throat> to Einstein. What about the human time? And what uh, Bergson uh, stated was that we are in the constant motion, and what we define as time is this scientific time, which is used in physics. While what happens to human beings, which are the center of philosophy, what happens to the uh, human beings is duration, or durée in, in French. Uh, duration is a constant flow of time and our life. And duration is impossible without memory. Uh, in fact, what, uh, uh, what uh, he did, uh, he represented uh, time and uh, human consciousness as in the stage of becoming, constant becoming, and as, uh, what should I say, as products of it or as instruments of it, uh, he uh, spoke about two reels. One reel is the real of our life. And the real of our life brings us to uh, entropy and brings us to the end of our lives. The other reason is memory. And if the one, the first one is unwinding, the second one is winding. And as we live, as we grow older, uh, the experience of our consciousness i.e. our memory, gets fatter and fatter. Well, until you lose bits and pieces of it, that's my comment. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what Bergson says, he, he connects hum human consciousness and looks at what is happen happening to us uh, as constant becoming, constant change. How do we define past, present, and future. We denote, we define them as something dynamic too. Uh, he speaks about uh, the triad of uh, past, present, and future. So something that is happening now, the idea of the present or now, he represents as a mathematical point and or as two feet, one foot stands in the past and the other one stands in the future. And what we call the present is so fluid, so it uh, extinguishes itself so fast that we cannot really speak about what is present. And it is from this point of view that he looks at time uh, slash durée 
And this is from this point of view that he looks at human life. Very important detail that we should uh, add to it is that time is completely impossible or durée is completely impossible without memory. So time and memory or durée and memory are constantly intermingled. And the stronger our memory is of a fragment of reality, the stronger our memory is, the more it is mingled. And sometimes, as uh, Bergson insists, sometimes we can uh, mix one for the other. So we can take something that is our memory as reality. That is one thing. And another thing, uh, another uh, notion that he introduces is the notion of elan vital or the, uh, the life impetus. This life impetus is in the basis both of human evolution. And here I would say that uh, both Bergson and very openly and loudly Nabokov had their problems uh, with Darwin. Not that they denied what, what was done by Darwin as uh, say the creationalists and people who look at it from a very different point of view, but they found certain faults in Darwin's theory, which needed correction and which needed correction from the point of view of this constant change and not only from the point of view of the survival of the fittest. So finally, uh, the idea of uh, matter and mind. Uh, what uh, Bergson says, it's a little bit vague for me and he doesn't uh, doesn't specify it for a very simple reason because he didn't want to be uh, <clears throat> uh, to be criticized for taking a religious position, which he at first didn't, but closer to the end of his life, he started believing in uh, something rational that started it all. And again, that was completely unclear what, what it was. Uh, anyway, matter in uh, Bergson's understanding was something that was moving towards its decline, while consciousness was ever making, ever becoming, ever developing, and uh, uh, ever powerful. Uh, so these are the uh, these are certain uh, uh, <clears throat> certain initial basic non. Uh, notions that I wanted to introduce uh, to continue with uh, Nabokov. Uh, Nabokov was very much into Bergson's ideas. He was one of the uh, one of the authors he read most, and one of the few he agreed with. Nabokov was very well known for his capriciousness and his ad hoc uh, denial of existence to major writers. Uh, we all know the story of uh, Nabokov and Dostoevsky when Nabokov called uh, Dostoevsky uh, the author of the double and that was, it. that was all that Dostoevsky was given from Nabokov. Uh, but uh, uh, to Bergson, he uh, paid tribute and was, uh, and uh, treated him with great respect. Uh, what I am doing in my research, I'm trying to look at how uh, Bergson's ideas become <clears throat> transparent and how they enter, uh, how they enter uh, Nabokov's prose. I will start and probably this will be the only uh, novel which I will manage to speak about uh, today. I will speak about uh, his novel, Mary. It was his first novel in which he tells the story. I will try to be very brief. He tells the story of a young man who fought against Bolshevism in uh, Russia, who emigrated uh, to, uh, after fighting 
in fighting the battles who emigrated with the Vrongil's army uh, from the Russian Crimea and found himself living in Germany. Who a lot of money, but money to survive, uh, doing all kinds of things and sometimes uh, very different things uh, from uh, actually sending brilliantine, something for polishing your uh, hair, to, uh, to selling uh, real brilliance or di diamonds. And Nabokov plays on words in uh, Russian between brilliance, which are diamonds, and brilliantine, which is a some sort of a liquid for treating your hair. So he lives in uh, Berlin, spends the money that he had earned in different ways, uh, is miserable, falls into deep depression, uh, whereby he finds himself unable to get up in the morning, to get dressed, to put an end to his useless relationship with a woman he doesn't love. And the only thing he dreams and thinks about is how to escape and how to go further south. But he continues to be nostalgic about his country and he loses belief in, uh, in the possibility of return. Now, <clears throat> what happens uh, what happens to him further on? Through a incredible uh, uh, through an incredible case of running in without knowing it into present husband of Mary, who is waiting for Mary to come back in six days to come and join him in Germany. Uh, he, is presented, he sees the uh, photo picture of Mary. And this is a huge shock. Huge shock that completely changes his life. Uh, it happens on, uh, which is important, it happens on Monday night. And from Monday night until Saturday morning, he relives in his memory the story of their romance. He relives this story simultaneously living in the uh, Russian pension in Germany. And in fact, what happens are the exact two lines, the exact two reels that Bergson uh, speaks about. One reel is his life, uh, and at that point, he is close to feeling the coming of death. He is that depressed. And the other line is his remembrance of uh, meeting this uh, wonderful young woman uh, of his love with her. I'm not saying falling with, in love with her, because I'll speak about it a little later, of his love for her. And uh, all of and those two reels spin in the course of four days. On the fourth day, he decides to execute the plan he had put together. And his plan was very simple, to make the guy drunk, I mean the husband, uh, and he does make him drunk. Uh, the guy stays in his room and sleeps. The last thing that Ganyan, our protagonist, does, he changes the clock so that the alarm clock will sound uh, two hours later. And he goes to the railway station. He comes to the railway station very early to pick her up from the train, sits on a bench, and suddenly decides that he won't pick her up, that their relationship is exhausted. And he takes a cab, goes to a totally different railway station, leaves for the south of Germany with a plan of continuing on the way to France and finally to some seaport to start earning money again. It is Nabokov's first novel. And this first novel, 
I don't know, at least I was uh, stunned by the skill with which it was written. Uh, the one thing where I will deviate a little bit from the uh, topic of time, the one thing uh, that is stunning that Mary, real Mary, never appears in the novel. The only Mary that we know in the novel is the Mary of the memory. While the real one, he waits for the train to come and only to arrive and only then he takes a cab and goes in the other direction. So here is the story and the plot is as primitive as most of Pushkin's plots. But as for the timelines, they are really complicated and quite interesting. Uh, the first one is the uh, theme uh, that is developed, the theme of the Russian emigres. Now the Russian emigres live in a pension uh, which is uh, situated right next to the railway tracks. And every time a train comes, Ganyan, the protagonist, has the impression that those trains come straight through the building. This actually uh, emphasizes the idea of uh, the people who live in this, or who stay in this pension, of being ghosts, that's how uh, Nabokov and Ganyan call them, ghosts or shadows, somebody who doesn't exist anymore, somebody who has been swept into the past with actually no hope of, uh, ever, uh, of ever succeeding in anything. The only two people who succeed are a pair of gay dancers uh, who actually get a contract in Germany. A poet, probably a known poet in uh, Russia before he emigrated, a symbolist is shown to be dying with serious heart problems and uh, uh, with dignity but still he, his time is past. The Russian woman who uh, married a German, uh, a German uh, uh, commerçant uh, will soon die too. And uh, uh, the younger woman, uh, young Russian typist is turning 26 and she understands that she will never succeed. She will never get married. So it is a, dismal enough Russian picture of reality. I mean, you cannot go any further. And when, uh, uh, when Ganyan leaves, he leaves uh, the poet uh, dying in his room. Uh, how does Nabokov work in with time? Uh, one of the interesting things is that he marks the difference between time and space. Uh, I'm sure all of us know from, uh, from high school uh, that Einstein always spoke about time space. Now, what do we find in the pension? Uh, each of the pensioners, uh, except for the uh, two gay dancers who live together, has a room. Uh, the rooms have numbers. But where do the numbers come from? The numbers co come from the last year's calendar in which the uh, uh, landlady of the pension cut out uh, six days in April. So one April 1st, April 2nd to April 6th, right? So the numbers of the room are random. But what is interesting, the seating at the table in the dining room, repeat the numbers of the rooms. Still time and space are separate. And again, to emphasize the ghost-like uh, nature of the uh, residents of the pension, uh, Nabokov uh, gives them the leaves from the last year's uh, calendar. What do we find in literary criticism? For the most part, researchers happily, uh, happily uh, analyze it and happily 
uh, define it as uh, the landlady's frugality. She is so frugal that she divided all the furniture that she had, that she inherited from her husband and uh, to different rooms. And uh, I cannot but say it, it's really touching when we speak about the two uh, armchairs which are separated and which uh, from each other. Uh, that's on the one hand. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we also find the dining room. And in the dining room above the table, there is a copy of the Last Supper. So whatever, whatever detail, and Nabokov is a great lover of details, whatever detail you take, uh, Nabokov will show you that uh, <clears throat> these people are the people of the past. The interesting thing in the uh, interrelationship between time and space, we'll find in yet another uh, heart-wrenching episode, uh, thinking about his life, uh, Ganyan, uh, the protagonist, uh, remembers that uh, <clears throat> he did all kinds of jobs, right? We remember from brilliant to brilliance. He was also an extra in the shooting of the movies. And he goes to the movie theater, uh, sits in this movie theater, and suddenly recognizes himself as an extra in the movie. And his thought is extremely indicative of a Bergsonian thought. He thinks about how this moment in time, when, they were, when the movie was shot, how this moment of time was multiplied and sent as copies of the movie to different cities and towns. And his last thought is, and I will never know when and where my image will show up and how and when uh, and who will, who, will, who will be the spectators, right? So this is another thing that uh, throws us into a Bergsonian understanding of time. Uh, another thing that uh, we should uh, concentrate on is how uh, Nabokov uh, gives us the story, the, uh, the love story, uh, as the story of creation. And what Bergson speaks about all the time is the creation of uh, reality. So the whole book starts with a dark scene, and this will be probably the, the last thing I'll be speaking about. Uh, he speaks about the uh, scene in the lift or elevator when the husband, the present husband of Mary, and Ganyan, her first lover, the two of them are stuck in an elevator and the light goes off. So the two of them are in complete darkness. What is the usual analysis we find in uh, literature? What we find is that uh, this is a way to emphasize the conflict. This is the way of showing the protagonist and the antagonist uh, in one small space. And actually this is bringing up uh, the conflict. But on the surface, in explicitly, there is no conflict. A, they don't know, either of them doesn't know who they are in relation to Mary. And B, even when it becomes known, uh, uh, at least known to Ganyan, he never shows it. So uh, it should be, it can be, and should be uh, interpreted in a very different way. And this is a Bergsonian slash Nabokovian way. Uh, if we look, and I promise there will be one quote uh, from <clears throat> Nabokov's uh, speak memory. Uh, Nabokov defines life in the following way. Our life is just a crevice of light in between two dark voids, right? 
before birth and after death. So our life is but a crevice of light. And he compares it to the door that is a crack open, uh, the door from his nursery when he is a little boy and uh, is very afraid of this darkness. So uh, what, uh, what uh, Alexander Dalinin, one of the best researchers of Nabokov, uh, says, and here I completely agree with him, is that what you, uh, what Nabokov does, he shows us this darkness before the creation of the image of Mary. It, he shows us the darkness before the image shows up. And to emphasize it, on the night, on the next day, on Monday, so they meet uh, in this elevator on Sunday, the next day on Monday, uh, it happens so that during the night, uh, they find themselves, I will omit the details, they find themselves in uh, the husband's room. And the husband shows him the picture of his wife. Ganyan silently without saying anything, leaves the room. He goes out. Uh, for a walk. He is so overwhelmed by what, by what had happened. Uh, he goes out uh, onto the street and suddenly in the complete darkness he sees fireworks. And these fireworks are not real fireworks. This is a, an example of vulgar advertisement. But this vulgar advertisement prints the letters. Can this be possible. And there are sparkles coming all around. And certainly this question, can this be possible, is addressed to Ganya. And uh, I'm sorry, John, shall I stop here? No, John. Okay, I will probably then say one last thing and then uh, are there a lot of questions, Vinny? Hi, John. Are there a lot of questions? Can I speak for another five minutes? Of course. Yes, absolutely. Good. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the, the image of those letters, can this be possible? Completely change Ghani. The next morning, he is a new man with a lot of energy and ready for action. And this is another of Bergson's concept. That is the concept of Elan Vital, the impetus of life. He immediately goes and breaks up with a woman he doesn't like, doesn't love anymore. And he goes into a park, sits down on a bench and suddenly some sort of a gray little something stretches itself at his feet and this gray little something is his memory and Ganyan says to it now speak now you can speak now there is no woman he didn't love uh, now he is ready for a romance with his beloved with his first love and during these four days, he listens to his memory. He creates, recreates the image of his beloved. And he carefully prepares the setting in which he can put her. He recreates the story of their love during the first summer, of their falling, almost falling apart, because there is no not a sign of real sexual relationship uh, during the winter when they wander from one museum to another or kiss each other in the terrible cold. And then the next summer, she is in one place, he is in a different place, and they see each other only once and nothing happens. So the romance story is almost ended. 
but it won't be Nabokov. Nabokov gives it, gives it a little twist. They meet yet again, a little bit later on the train, and she treats him to wonderful chocolate. And at that moment, he thinks certainly not within the context of the chocolate, but at that moment, he thinks that he is in love with her, was in love with her, and will be in love with her all his life. So what prevents him when he prepared everything, when everything was ready, what prevents him from meeting her, from, putting, uh, from picking her up from the train? And what prevents him is exactly the idea that when memory is exhausted, together with the ghosts of the pension, and here I'm almost quoting, together with the ghosts of the pension, the dying poet, the uh, uh, spinster, a young woman, uh, Mary is residing there. She is a memory. And what kind of Mary will it be uh, who arrives on this train? He doesn't know. And he is a different man. So the story is exhausted. And to reiterate it, uh, Nabokov does his own thing, which uh, Alexander Dalinin also very wisely notices. There is a building built by the station. And as Ganyan sits there, he uh, watches the building being completed. And he sees the workers passing to each other uh, the tiles for the roof. And this procedure has a calming effect on him. But at the same time, it hints to us, the readers, if we are very smart, because it didn't hint it to me when I first read the novel, uh, that the novel is coming to its end. It is the roof that is being laid. And uh, there is no sense in trying to bring memory and to step once again uh, into one and the same uh, river. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have time for some discussion and questions, commentary. Um, you can put something in the chat or you can just raise your virtual hand or your your real hand or just shout it out. Any um, give people a couple minutes. I'm looking in the chat. Um, a couple of people made comments. Does anybody um, have a hand? Is that a hand, Polly? Go ahead. Yeah. Was I muted? Okay. Um, no, I did. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, it, it was. I was just saying, although I was muted, that it was such a wonderful talk, and I think we're stunned because it feels as though the last roof tiles were laid um, in your talk too, and. It's almost as though we don't want to break that silence. That's just some sort of perfectly constructed, rounded, beautiful thing that's in us now. But I'm sure there will be questions. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer the questions if I know the answers. A friend of mine always when he finished uh, his lectures, uh, he would look around and say, could you please ask me what is, what is uh, 
uh, my favorite novel by this author? <laughs> or uh, how many novels of this author I have read? <laughs> okay, so what is your favorite <laughs> novel by this author and how many novels by this author have you read? I have read many novels by this author. I haven't read his last uh, novel uh, <clears throat> about the Harlequins, uh, but I think uh, my favorite is The Eye. I was so stupid that I planned to talk about three novels. to tell you about maybe half of what I had about Mary. So it is the Russian proverb, Vyak živi, vyak uh, learn as you live. And uh, I certainly made a huge mistake uh, by not reading it in advance to myself. But I cannot, I, I never read, I just speak. So I have this text. <laughs> May I ask something then? Sure. Sure, we do, yeah. We yeah. have a hand, but go ahead, Paul. Oh, okay. Then, uh, no. Paul let me just, and let me just on them. Mm -hmm. this is not even a fully formulated question but i'm so interested in always in the way writing itself functions as a certain kind of memory and and i'm wondering how that works in this story okay so i'm going to come clean here and say that this story was my favorite of all Nabokov's works, and I think I've read not all of them, but most of them and some of them over and over. Um, I was so moved by this, this story and I hadn't remembered it at all. I mean, I, I was, now I remember that it was, that it was my favorite for years and years. Um, and, uh, but anyway, that's an aside. What, what I'm interested in is, is how, so we, so it's about this, this um, the way memory is, can make us live, can be a reason for living, can, can give rise to this elan vital, right? I this think, is, I think I got it, Paulie. Good, uh, what, because uh, <laughs> I'm what floundering. Happens uh, what happens in uh, this novel, and this is, again, this is an excellent question because this is connected with Bergson's theory. Uh, he speaks about uh, Elan Vital, uh, about this impetus to live. And he says that it can, this impetus of life or to live is the basis of evolution evolution of, uh, uh, say, life on Earth, on the one hand. Uh, it can be the uh, basis of a, personal, uh, of a personal evolution. And it can be an impetus, and actually that's the meaning of the word uh, elan. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an impetus for action. And in fact, seeing the picture, uh, produces such a strong impression on the protagonist that what he does, he comes back to life. He comes back to life, he, uh, and Bergson reiterates and insists on reviving memory, being work. So what, uh, what Ganyan does, he remembers, and it is work for him. Uh, it is a big project of reviving each and every detail, of going all the way uh, with his characters. But when this is exhausted, there is another impetus, 
And this is the impetus that uh, occurs uh, as he is sitting on the bench and uh, watching the house being built. And again, there are, I mean, when you speak about Nabokov, it's very dangerous, slippery ground because there is so much written. And uh, just to give you an example, there is an author, I certainly forgot both the name and the title of the article, uh, who shows that the yellow light is the sign of, uh, the yellow color is the sign of Mary. So in the first scene in the elevator, uh, when the light comes back, it is suddenly the elevator is flooded with yellow light. And in the very end is the yellow framework of the house. And that the uh, tiles are put on this framework covering it means that is the end, that is the end of Mary. But there is a new impetus when he very uh, energetically gets up and goes in the other direction. Um, thank you. We have another hand, Anna. Well, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I suppose all the colleagues will agree with this, but my question is a bit trivial. I'm sorry for that, but in what other works by Nabokov can we, um, can we notice or analyze such topics as time, space, and some of their interrelations? Well, probably we will think, and I will think it myself, uh, but another question is about some theoretical pieces of work which are available on the internet or in some, I don't know, libraries, which we can read on that. I will probably start with the first question and the answer will be very brief. In each and every novel by Nabokov, there is a, an issue of space and time. And in uh, such novels as uh, Ada, he tries to completely get rid of the time aspect and to write something timeless. And, uh, uh, and this happens, the, uh, the showing of time is a, I would say, prerequisite uh, feature of uh, Nabokov's novels in general. Uh, to answer your second question is next to impossible because uh, I don't know whether it's the third or the fourth place Nabokov takes after the Bible, Shakespeare and Chomsky. Uh, but he is somewhere there high up in the hierarchy. So if you are interested in anything specific, do write to me and I can uh, send you what I have. I've known a couple of people who stopped their career and stopped working on their dissertations because they found out that there is nothing to say. And I'm not sure that, that that somebody, somebody who is curious, somebody like you, will not look uh, thoroughly in the internet libraries and in the uh, published books libraries and find something that will be that will be published exactly on this topic. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, said that the question is a bit trivial. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Uh, Distria has a hand up. Uh, hi, thank you, John. And thank you, Anna, for a lovely talk. Um, and my question was uh, regarding, because it's been a long time since I've actually even thought about this, of about Mary and, um, and even Bergman's uh, philosophy as well on this. And I just wondered if you, if you thought that the, a lot of the ideas of space, time, and all of that, and of other of various philosophers that he mentions in his novels, as you said, and many of his novels, um, is that 
is that something that perhaps nowadays is sort of done less of in a sense because of how much there already is that we are in this kind of space and um um and technology type era that we don't really discuss this as much as then as that time uh that's a very good question and uh i will have to confess uh not another name uh comes to me with such prominence uh <clears throat> in uh, nabokov's uh, novels as the name uh of uh, uh bergson uh, I would say that uh, you can find a lot of uh, dialogical uh, relationships with uh, those with uh, sorry uh, with uh, <clears throat> Shakespeare mm -hmm. and uh, dialogue with uh, Flaubert. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes into more than controversial uh, relations with Dostoevsky, with whom he argues in most of his work. Uh, <clears throat> it is not exactly clear uh, whether uh, Nabokov knew Bakhtin, and this is a, a, uh, an issue that I'm very interested in because I would very much like to know whether he read Bakhtin and uh, because some of the ideas of both uh, Bergson and Bakhtin are uh, close. Yes, that's uh, correct. Again, maybe if I thought more, I would come up uh, with some other names, but not at the moment. No, thank you. That's um, partly why I was asking. Yeah, because I know some a lot of these philosophers, as you as you mentioned, <clears throat> Bakhtin and Bergman, a lot of them are quite similar. So I yeah, um, and I was just thinking, especially nowadays, we are more reliant on science than we are on the philosophy side of things, the theoretical side of things, and um i it, i think it's be, it would be quite interesting what we could kind of learn from from that from the past in the literatures on that i will tell you something in which i'm definitely not an expert uh but certainly uh i would look at Gilles Deleuze uh, a french philosopher of the 60s and i will look uh at uh, gosh i forgot her name uh, uh, never mind. I would like I would look at the serious feminist philosophers mm -hmm. who picked up Bergson's ideas and are develop, developing them now. Thank you. You're welcome. Other comments or questions? Okay, well, let's thank our invited speaker. <laughs> Once thank you again. for inviting me. <laughs> our pleasure. And uh, we'll see you all at the